In the 1950s, as demand for computers grew, the idea of multiple users being able to use the same machine at the same time developed. Batch processing was introduced for multiple users to submit their jobs typically on punch cards to be processed in batches. This was a tedious process, slow and did not provide the user with instant feedback. In the 1960s a concept called time sharing evolved. Time sharing allowed multiple users at the same time to interact with a computer directly from their terminal. Time sharing allowed users to receive instant feedback on their work. Whereas with batch processing, an error in your code might not be apparent for hours or even days later until you receive a response from the batch operator, with time sharing you could receive almost instant feedback. If your code contained errors, it would be directly visible on the screen to you. This made computers much more efficient in how they manage general operations. The compatible time sharing system, otherwise known as CTSS, was one of the earliest time sharing operating systems. It was developed by MIT and released in 1961. CTSS had a lot of influence on the development of other time sharing operating systems. Operating systems like Multics. Development began on Multics in 1964 in a joint operation between MIT, General Electric and Bell Labs. Multics had a lot of novel concepts for the time like multi-level security and a hierarchical file system which would inspire future operating systems. Two developers of Multics, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, were working in Bell Labs at this time. However, in 1969, Bell Labs decided to pull out of the project. While Thompson and Ritchie saw some merits in Multics, they considered it to be too resource demanding and complex in design. Running Multics was a very expensive endeavour and Thompson and Ritchie wanted to design an operating system that was more straightforward to use with less demanding hardware requirements. It would use a small kernel where the development team could gradually expand the user space through revision over time. That operating system would be known as Unix. The new project between Thompson and Ritchie was nameless. In 1970, Brian Kernighan suggested as a pawn on Multics to use the name Uniplexed Information and Computer Service, or Unix for short. This spelling at some point changed to UNIX, and thus Unix was born. The earliest incarnation of Unix ran on a PDP-7, but soon after was ported to a PDP-11. It was written in assembly language, and the kernel only had a few thousand lines of code. Version 1 Unix was released in November of 1971. In many ways it was similar to today's modern Unix and Linux systems, but in many ways it was also very different. It had a very small user space. Many commands and programs we take advantage for today like PWD or VI were not available. It had no TCP IP stack, no C compiler and was written in assembly language. It also had a much smaller footprint in comparison to later Unix systems. Some command names were different also, to change direction you had to type chdir instead of cd. Development of the C language began in 1972. Version 2 Unix included a C compiler and version 3 Unix included a C debugger. It wasn't until November of 1973 with the release of version 4 Unix was the Unix system rewritten in the C language instead of assembly. The decision to change from assembly language to C played a huge role in increasing the portability of the system. Version 5 Unix was the first version of Unix to see a release in select educational institutes, allowing users to study the operating system. It included some new commands like print working directory and spell. Version 6 Unix is when Unix gained huge traction, especially in educational institutes, where John Lyons released a book documenting the code of version 6 Unix line by line, allowing students to better understand the operating system. It was also where Unix entered the commercial market. It included some important utilities and system calls like cron, change group and ptrace. The first release of BSD was based on version 6 Unix, and BSD Unix would go on to play a huge role in the later Unix wars. Version 7 Unix has been described as the last true Unix. It was the first Unix to use the Born shell. It expanded the user commands and system call library from version 6, increasing the number of general commands from 81 to 136, and from 43 to 47 system calls. It was bundled with important programs like tar, tail and make along with the awk language. It was the first version of Unix to come with UUCP. And UUCP was an early protocol that allowed transfer of files between Unix systems and remote execution of commands. Version 7 Unix saw many changes and one of those changes was to the licensing of the operating system. Universities were no longer permitted to teach version 7 Unix due to AT&T tightening up their licensing. This was partially in response to John Lyons' book, which had described the source code of the preceding version of Unix in great detail, perhaps too much detail in the eyes of AT&T. 
Andrew Tannenbaum, who had taught operating system design using version 6 Unix in university in Amsterdam, wanted to continue teaching version 7 Unix, but because of strict new licensing it became impossible. This led him to develop in Minix, an early Unix clone which was system core compatible with version 7 Unix. Minix would go on to inspire the development of Linux by Linus Torvalds. If you wish to learn more about the history of Minix, check out my video on the Minix operating system. From version 7 Unix spawned two important Unix lineages, System 3 Unix, which was AT&T's successor to version 7, and 3BSD, Berkeley's Unix offering. System 3 quickly evolved into System 5 Unix, while 3BSD developed into BSD4 or 4BSD. Both groups of developers engaged in a battle of innovation over the following years. AT&T's System 5 saw itself as the Unix standard, while BSD pushed innovation and was the first of the two to include TCP IP. Eventually, both systems would evolve to include the best of both worlds. System 5 E4 would go on to include some BSD features like TCP IP, and would be the basis for some of the most successful commercial Unix systems like Solaris, Unixware, HP UX and AIX. From BSD, both NetBSD and FreeBSD would be developed in 1993 via an open source derivative called 386 BSD. In 1996, due to some issues between developers, Theo de Rot would create OpenBSD, a fork from NetBSD with heavy emphasis on security. All open source BSDs are still alive to this day. In 1984, after becoming disillusioned with restricted licensing and Unix being only available in binary form instead of source code, Richard Stallman decided to rewrite the Unix operating system as free software. While today's GNU project includes a kernel called Herd, much more emphasis earlier on was focused on rewriting software libraries first. Stallman didn't want a kernel without software to utilize it, so initially he opted to invest his time in the user land. He would, along with other GNU project members, go on to develop text editors, compilers, utilities to replicate common Unix commands along with a shell and desktop environment, all made freely available as open source software. While development of the software library was moving along at a quick pace, kernel development was moving much more slowly. Linus Torvalds, who was inspired by the development of the Minix operating system, began development on his own operating system in 1991. By September of that year he released his first Linux kernel. Linux, however, was not a complete operating system. It lacked the user land, but that void was filled with the GNU project, and thus GNU Linux was born. Fifty years after the development of the Unix operating system, its legacy lives on in many ways, and we can be thankful to Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, for they truly are the underappreciated heroes in computing history.